some of you might know my polar bear pictures. Um, some of you might have heard about me a little bit. Um, if you haven't, uh, that's why I'm here. <laughs> um, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about um, my experience living amongst uh, polar bears um, and other wildlife, but specifically polar bears. Touching base on sort of everything we discussed tonight, I spent between 2021 and 2022, 33 days living in a little setup like that, uh, camping next to the Arctic's most apex predator. So over the years, or as we spent the 33 days living with, with the bears, we really got to build our relationship with these animals. And see, as people, we look at our natural world and we have our own biases and our own way of looking at the world. But as soon as we immerse ourselves in it, as soon as we start to see these animals for a little bit more than they actually are, we start to see them as something else. And for our instance, we started to look at polar bears, not necessarily as dangerous predators that you would not really mess with, that you wouldn't really walk around. And we started to see them as loving parents, as, you know, Basically, I started to understand them sometimes a little bit more than I understand most of my friends. <laughs> Over the 33 days, it took some time. Sometimes it took five days, sometimes it took two, sometimes it took over a week for us to get to know these animals in such a way that we were comfortable enough walking around them. But for the most part, a lot of the time, they actually walked around our camp. They came to visit, as you see here. Um, this bear, each one has a name, by the way. This one is Sniggle Fritz. Um, <laughs> um, we named every single one of them, and it was for the sheer matter that I wanted the bears to connect with all of you. I wanted you to see these bears as something else than a polar bear, but it also helped us identify them. I mean, working in the Arctic for that amount of time, I've seen over 100 different polar bears, and you might be wondering at this point, you know, how do you know which polar bear is which? Each one has its own sort of characteristic, something that defines it. It can be visual, you can see it and you can say, oh, that's Wanda. Oh, that's uh, Slim Jim. You know, you can identify them based on characteristics. And sometimes um, it's their character that identifies them. For instance, this one bear, he actually loved our camp a lot more than the others. So every time we left, he came. <laughs> so while living in the Arctic, when the bears weren't around our camp, we were walking around them, trying to capture images that were different from what we usually see. The polar bears, you see pictures of how many times are they skinny? How many times are they not doing so well, especially in the summer? You know, those are the images that we as people identify with, and that's what we see polar bears as. We wanted to go up to the Arctic and film something different. We wanted to film these bears in their natural habitat as polar bears. And we differentiated this, you know, we look at the natural world and we say, okay, well, the people leave. And we think, okay, well, nature is not there anymore. We're not there to document it. But as soon as we leave, nature starts to behave naturally. And that's actually when we started our expedition. So we used remote control cameras, underwater housings. I was actually like four feet away from this polar bear taking this picture um, to really immerse ourselves in the natural world and immerse ourselves in the lives of these polar bears. Now, as I go through these pictures, something you might see is the lack of ice in these pictures. And that's exactly what inspired these expeditions. It was to go to the Arctic when all the ice disappears. But I think we forget that a lot of the Arctic is ice free. And a lot of the Arctic has been ice free for hundreds of years. You know, as the natural cycle of summer and spring and fall, the Arctic freezes and it melts and this cycle repeats. And these polar bears have been living in this rather ice-free world for, for millennia. They have been living in this part of the Arctic amongst flowers, adapting to their environment. There's many ideas as to why they do this, hypotheses as to why they are in this environment, one of them being that these animals actually in this area rely on Inuit hunters. In this specific area, there is actually archeological sites that go back hundreds of years. And there's that connection of, as soon as these bears hear a gunshot, as soon as they see an Inuit person, they associate that with food. It's like ringing a dinner bell. And all of a sudden they all gather to this spot as if they were gathering there for hundreds and thousands of years to feed. 
And it just so happens that this one spot is amongst fields of flowers. <laughs> this is that picture I was talking about. This picture was in National Geographic last September, and it was the introduction, I would say, to people seeing polar bears in a different light, seeing them in a different environment, seeing them in an environment that, while unconventional to us, is very natural to these polar bears. You see, they live in this, in the southern Hudson Bay, north of Churchill, Manitoba, which if you look at it from a geography perspective, is actually northern BC. So if you imagine if we had polar bears, we're about nine hours drive from polar bears <laughs> if we were living in Manitoba. So they're actually quite down south, meaning that there's a completely different climate in this area uh, that attracts these animals. So, you know, again, something completely different from um, what we're used to seeing. But by living with them, it was building that relationship that enables us to capture these moments. And I always say a mom nursing her baby is like the pinnacle of all relationship building with a polar bear because all of a sudden this bear is just sitting there lying in a field of flowers completely vulnerable and feeding her cub. Feeding her cub in this instance but we saw this time and time again and there was just something absolutely magical about this moment where you're staring this so-called predator in the eyes and they're choosing to be in your presence and to, you know, not bother you at all. Uh, I mean, these guys bothered us a little bit, I will say. <laughs> um, you can tell they're a little bit intimidating. They're uh, two years old teenagers, of course, um, and they kept on running to our camp and, and causing a ruckus, but I did spend over 10 days with them. The Bernstein Bears, they were called. Absolute <laughs> pleasure. <laughs> a part of these bears living in this environment, a part of them being there for so long, it means they're adapting to it. They're adapting to their changing world. The only thing is their world is changing a lot faster because of us. And historically speaking, these bears have learned to change, to change with their environment. You know, the Arctic, our whole planet has been cooling and warming for millions of years. And animals have changed with it or they have gone extinct. Fortunately, these bears are changing with it. Actually, in this instance, this is one of the first documented shots of, potentially this is a pizzly. I don't know if anyone in this room knows what a pizzly is. It's a mix between a grizzly bear and a polar bear. And this specific bear actually hunted while gruesome. He would chase them from the fields of flowers into the water. And there he could strategically see them in the water and pick them out from the crowd and go after them. And this was his, you know, um, that was what he fed on during the summer. Polar bears aren't meant to feed in the summer. That's one of the reasons why they're actually the, you know, why we're focusing on them so much in the Canadian, or in the Arctic in general, is because in the winter time, that's when they are supposed to feed. And unfortunately, that is the part that's changing the fastest. But in the summertime, they're usually sleeping around, sleeping in flowers, and sometimes feeding on, uh, on churns and other animals. So this bear, he was new. He learned this behavior just genetically over time. He learned to utilize that he doesn't just have to sit around in the flowers all summer waiting for winter. He can actually eat and find food. That's the bright side of these things. These animals are changing. They're adapting to this environment. Unfortunately, they're adapting to this changing planet and they're changing along with it. But one important thing is we're forcing them to do it at a much faster pace. I want you to think for a second, see this picture. That is the Arctic Ocean. It's completely frozen. And in your minds, how long does it take to change from that to this? Completely frozen into this. You might be thinking months, weeks, that's about three weeks. It takes about three weeks for the Arctic to change from completely frozen to partially frozen, and then another two weeks after that, there's no ice at all. Historically, this has been, you know, very set on schedules. The wor natural world operates in a very fixed time frame. You know, it's used to, you know, in July, the ice is going to melt. I'm not going to eat until November. In November, I'm going to start feeding again. The winters are getting shorter, so that ice, all of a sudden, it's melting in June, sometimes May, and it's forming a lot later, sometimes as late as in December. So it is this change we're forcing onto the natural world 
which is an incredibly balanced environment, we're focused, making it so unbalanced through our actions. It was said earlier today, every action has a reaction. Same in the natural world. Every action we have here today, driving our cars, eating, building our houses, you know, all of that has a reaction in the natural world. When you drive your car, you're polluting rivers. When you're building your house, you're deforesting a whole forest. All of that has an impact on our life. Some of you might remember last year, might be two years ago now, I apologize, I'm on Arctic time. Um, <laughs> um, we had the floods in, in Abbotsford, in Sumas. And we all wondered, why did this happen? You know, why did all of a sudden this flood happen? And it's that exact thing, it's the action reaction. You know, we log the forest. That forest all of a sudden can't hold its moisture. That water has to go somewhere, it fills our valleys, and then we're surprised we have a flood. Same thing happens in the Arctic, but in a much broader term. But with all of this comes a huge abundance of life. With that change in the Arctic Ocean, we see an explosion of animals, hundreds of thousands of beluga whales, and this picture doesn't even do it justice. They were as far as the eye could see. Polar bears, bowhead whales. The Arctic is incredibly rich in wildlife. And when I mentioned earlier the polar bear grizzly bear, this is actually one of the first, if not the first ever documented interaction between a polar bear and a grizzly bear. On one side there's the grizzly bear, on the other side there's the polar bear. They're actually combining their forces to hunt beluga whales in this one estuary. So once again, adapting. But as the Arctic is changing, all of a sudden new animals are coming up to the Arctic. They're potentially competing with the polar bears, definitely interbreeding with the polar bears, but creating a unbalance that is unknown to us. You know, especially because we look at the Arctic in a very small time frame. We have to look at the Arctic in a much broader sense of what did this environment look like hundreds of years ago. Now, the pictures I'm about to show after this one, I apologize, they're a little bit gruesome, um, but they're important to show because as people, we have our biases and we look at things the way we want to see them. Now, you see this picture and you see hunters, and they're hunting a whale. We look at it as trophy hunters, potentially something bad, something that shouldn't be happening, but they're actually Inuit hunters gathering their food. This, they've been doing this for hundreds of years, millions of years. They've been in the Arctic hunting for their food. And looking at this picture, I've got a lot of backlash for taking these, but not from the Inuit community, I've immersed myself in the Inuit community trying to tell stories like this. This is the reason I'm showing it to you today because the next time you see a picture of locals hunting, I want you to not see it as trophy hunting. I want you to see the whole story behind it and see that in the grocery store, a little piece of meat costs $90. A vegetable, you can't get a vegetable. There's no such thing as really being a vegetarian in the Arctic, nothing grows there. So I want you to take all of that into consideration when you see pictures like this, because just because we don't want to see them doesn't mean they don't exist. And it doesn't mean that they don't affect people's lives. And we as photographers, cinematographers, we are up there to capture these moments. And this is exactly the food that they're gathering. This food will go on to feed an entire community for the entire winter potentially, a few of these beluga whales, entirely a lot more sustainable than what we're doing back home. That's the Inuit people actually catching a seal and eating it right there on the ice. Completely different to what we're used to, but completely normal up north. So leaving here today, I want you to take something away. And it's, we as people over the years have gotten so disconnected from the natural world. You know, we drive our cars, we live in our houses, we don't go hiking, we don't go outside, we live in these constructed cities. And the idea is that if we look at the natural world and immerse ourselves in it, we start to realize what it is that is at stake if we lose it and see what's worth protecting. Mm -hmm.